Okay. <clears throat> Somehow greatness thrust upon them, I guess. Um, all right. We're going to look, do some painting, some more painting today. Um, doing this teaching at a distance, I think it turns out that the, the painting component seems, I guess it's, it's so visual, but it seems to be jumping out at me in terms of, you know, how the production of these old video things goes. Anyway, uh, what the, um, we, the theme that we're going to talk about today is the interaction of this, this art, paintings, and other styles with other things that are going on, of course, the history, the politics, and in general, the culture. And, you know, in a sense, as you know, by now, you know, that's what the humanities class is all about. It's about showing your connection between all of these different things and showing you also that there's an historical narrative. And the thing about the narrative is that it is a story and it does have twists and turns, but they are connected to each other and there are threads and, and uh, ongoing uh, action that's unfolding. So when you look at history, in our case, art history that way, you can um, see the narrative, you can learn the story, think about telling the story. And so there are the different parts of the story and the different genres or periods of art are in that sense, different parts of the story. So that's another way of approaching it. In other words, just in general, what we don't want is to be in the situation of just having to memorize things because that's not very much fun. And it also doesn't make very much sense. You can memorize something and not know at all why it's what it is or where it is. So what we're gonna to do today is put together some stuff and we're gonna cover a lot of ground. However, as I said, the basic concepts today are very, very simple, I think you'll find. And so what I suggest in terms of watching this video is that you um, concentrate mostly on the paintings, because we're just going to look at a fair amount of paintings and have some fun looking at paintings today and making sense of the paintings. Now I'm saying that word paintings and it's it's not sounding like a real word. You know what I mean? When the word does that, paintings, paintings, paintings. Anyway, uh, so let's look at our, let's get more, let's get specific on their asses. Okay, and so Specifically, we're talking about the 18th century, the 1700s, the Enlightenment. And as I say, the, 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 as I said before, the 18th century, the 1700s, in a sense, that whole century is one big narrative. That whole century is one big story. We've already talked about that story, and we're just looking at it from another angle, the angle of uh, the history of painting today. But, you know, the basic story is the end of the 17th century, the end of the 1600s, you have the Sun King, Louis the Fourteenth, and he is building Versailles, the great some the greatest symbol of the Baroque, his great palace at Versailles. And so uh, the French King Louis is the most powerful man, possibly the most powerful man in the world, possibly the richest man in the world at that point, going into the 1700s. Um, but the reason that Louis the Fourteenth has all the wealth and power that he has is because he's the king of France and what's really changing is France. And in that 18th century, the 1700s, the population of France actually doubles during that time. And a whole middle class emerges. In fact, a number of different uh, parties and economic parties, merchants, guild members, even the peasants have rising expectations as the standard of living <clears throat> increases and great cultural changes are afoot in terms of people's attitude towards the church and the nobility, as we've also seen in a couple of the other videos. And when you say that, when I say that the Enlightenment century, 1700s, the 18th century, is itself just one big narrative, that is, in 1789, the whole world goes boom. Uh, the whole century is the story from the Sun King, Louis the 14th, and then at the end of the 17th century, and then by the end of the 18th century, the end of the 1700s, you have Louis the 16th, and he is trying as hard as he can with Marie Antoinette, by the way, he's not just a bimbo or something, he's a real person, and, and they are trying actually to reform things and catch up with this public cultural, social, and political changes to really galloping away. Now, in between there, in the beginning of the um, 18th century, you have Louis the 15th, and Louis the 15th's consort is Madame Pompadour, and you have 
a kind of uh, liberal period, culturally a liberal period. All right, so anyway, maybe that's getting heavy. I'm gonna get onto the slides now, but so the short story is that you start off the, uh, in a nutshell, the story here is you start off the 18th century with the sort of end uh, decadent late Baroque Rococo. And then you get the revolutions, plural, at the end of that century. And you get as part of that, um, a very politicized, even a sort of propagandistic art, neoclassicism. So that's what we're looking at. As I say, the basic concepts are easy. So let's look at some really interesting uh, and cool paintings from Baroque, from Baroque to Rococo. So we saw the Baroque, the Northern and the Southern, it's very opulent, very opulent art, very uh, rich kind of uh, look to it. And then you got a growing middle class. So you have now a demand for smaller decorative pieces, more people want art. But you have those giant Baroque uh, canvases because it was paintings for fabulously wealthy queens and rich people at giant age. Uh, Rococo is, it's kitschy. Now, actually, by the way, though, I would actually sort of like to make a little advertisement for Rococo today because, you know, in our standard sort of uh, undergraduate art history milieu in which I swim along the bottom, um, you know, your sort of basic kind of story is, okay, well, you had Baroque and then Baroque goes into this decadent phase uh, well, uh, France is sort of coming apart and lead up to the revolution, and that's Rococo. And Rococo is a kind of uh, trivial, uh, bad kind of art. And, uh, I don't know, it sort of fits things too much. I mean, also Rococo, of course, then is replaced by the neoclassical art, which is a very moralistic, political, kind of righteous art, which is another reason why people might hold it against Rococo, that is a kind of frivolous decorative form. But see, all that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I mean, you want to judge this Rococo art uh, on its own terms. Um, so yeah, and Rococo kind of uh, does exaggerate things a little bit. It doesn't have the commitment to technical proficiency that Baroque art does. Uh, it almost sort of has manneristic tendencies sometimes. Um, it also, I think another thing that's, that I want to stress today, actually, um, in putting together, you know, some, some Rococo paintings to show you is it strikes me that it's fairly sexy. I mean, it wants to be sexy. It's kind of in a silly way, but I mean, hey, we live in the beginning of the 21st century. We're, we're used to, to sexy stuff that's kitschy and silly, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> and as I mentioned, Madame Pompadour. Madame Pompadour also, we were talking before about the Encyclopedia of Diderot and we were talking about the French philosophes and uh, Madame Pompadour also thought that the Encyclopedia wasn't such a bad idea. And she was one of the reasons why the Encyclopedia got to uh, operate for a while in the open. So Madame Pompadour, I think people might get her mixed up with Marie Antoinette. Yes, that is where the word Pompadour comes from. Um, but actually she's a fairly progressive figure. Of course, I'd even defend Marie Antoinette, but I mean, um, that's what's necessary because you always want to push against the sort of historical cliches and stereotypes in order to kind of dig into what's really going on. Um, so what is Rococo? You know, it's, it's, it's sinuous, it's curved, it's not linear, it doesn't like straight lines. It wants to create a kind of environment in which you can sort of luxuriate. And it wants to do that on the cheap, but it does that with a lot of curlicues and filigrees. I think our cliche, sometimes you hear Baroque used in a, in a, um, in a slang sense as meaning very busy and very full. I think Rococo maybe even fits that. Uh, but looking at Rococo art, as I say, what do we want to do today? We want to appreciate maybe some of the beauty of Rococo art. If we can't, we want to. And what are we doing when we're doing that? Are we doing Rococo art any favors? No, folks, no, no, we're doing ourselves favors. That's why we're here. So Watteau, um, a, a friend of Madame Pompadour, someone who Madame, Madame Pompadour, what's she doing? She's thinking that things need to lighten up. Again, she's, you know, Louis XIV is gone and they're going through changes. 
and they and the monarchy understands that they're going through changes. You know, part of the story of the uh, 18th century is the French uh, nobility, the French monarchy, is trying to save itself, and it is unable to save itself. It's not like they're oblivious; they they know what's going on. So anyway, uh, Madame Pompadour and Watteau, you know, and they're thinking about again a lighter, more populist art. I mean, we think, oh well, Rococo is just a kind of decorative art. Well, how about we replace decorative with more populist art in the sense that, you know, we're going to sort of get art, art's getting out there now in a kind of sensibility. It's not just in the palaces. And this then is a very significant painting, in particular, since it is tied to, say, Madame Pompidour, the sign in Gersant's shop. So let's look at some details of this. There are a lot of paintings with paintings on the walls. Remember, Las Meninas had a lot of paintings on the walls. Sometimes it's really hard to see the paintings. Sometimes our reproductions here on the computer are good, sometimes not so good. This uh, print of it has this unfortunate and yet also somewhat useful, I suppose, line down the middle. Look at the left hand and the right hand. On the left hand, you see them putting a painting of Louis XIV. It's a pretty cheeky painting. They're putting a painting of Louis XIV in a box. They're creating it up taking it down and boxing it up. And on the right, there is a young uh, shop woman showing a, uh, some, a piece of art. We can't see what it is to some people. And some other people are looking at what is clearly a Rococo painting uh, because of the feathery plants. We'll see that in a second. The way they handle the leaves of the trees is, is something that's a Rococo kind of give, giveaway. Now, as to those paintings on the walls, though, on the left-hand side, we have portraits, you'll notice, and there are portraits of people from the old regime looking rather disapprovingly down. Whereas on the right-hand side, what we have are these Rococo uh, scenes, these uh, happy scenes, sort of idyllic scenes, and, uh, and Pompadour and Watteau kind of brainstormed these kinds. We'll have this genre where we have people sort of enjoying themselves in these idyllic sort of scenes. And those are the paintings on the right. And again, you can see their sexual paintings. There's a lot of nudes. So, um, so the sign in your saint's shop, again, a very sort of um, controversial sign, sending a signal um, and allowing this painting, of course, to be publicized and so on. The, 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 the castle, the palace is sending a signal that you know times are changing and we're going to lighten up and we're going to move and we're not going to have the strict kind of religiosity for example of baroque painting uh, we, this is not religious painting the play this is classic Watteau. again one thing to notice here look at those leaves in the trees that very light feathery kind of handling of the uh of the floral stuff is very significant is very distinctive of rococo again you have um people gentle people sort of lolling around in a kind of fantasized idyllic setting, maybe enjoying some art, enjoying some music, decorative, uh, making a statement. And he has a few of these festival of love statues and um, people taking a kind of idyllic break from reality maybe and maybe that's another idea that that's conscious in terms of um, the people who are supporting uh, Rococo as a style. All of the art from here on through that what we're looking at today until we you know let, later on we'll do the French impression of a different story is to some extent real politic and to some extent it's all propagandistic art I think including the Rococo art. So Boucher, um, another friend of Madame Pompidour, and a, as you can see from this portrait of him, he didn't paint it, a, you can see the look in his eyes, he says it's sort of, there's a distinct eroticism to, uh, to Rococo, which is part of the pushback. So Rococo, not just kitschy um, frivolity and texture, but Rococo also just, pushing the boundaries. I think sometimes it's overstated when people look at the French Impressionists at the end of the 19th century in terms of, 
um, they're having sort of uh, risque paintings, but the you know the, the Rococo painters are every bit as as daring, I think, as anything that we see with the Impressionists. Uh, notice the treatment of the colors, and uh, and the kind of subject matter again. Um, always, uh, you can see where Rococo is being looked upon as a lesser decadent form of Baroque, but of course that's one way of looking at it. You can also look at this painting and see something like Art Nouveau or Audrey Beardsley from a from hundred years later. Um, Jupiter and Callisto. Also taking now, I mean, the Baroque art would take kind of religious themes or classical themes and you know, it was sort of a convention. You kind of had to do it. You pretend sometimes, just frankly, pretending to be a good citizen while they were, meanwhile, doing their thing. Uh, but, but Rococo art is an art that comes up in a period of license. And this period of Louis the Fifteenth and Madame Pompidour in the beginning of the um, of the 1700s, it's like sort of the 1920s in the 20th century, it's a time of a little bit more license, a little more sexual license and artistic license, a lightening up. And that's one thing that Rococo expresses. Here's uh, his painting of Madame Pompadour, Watteau's painting of uh, Pompadour, no, this is Boucher, sorry, uh, from 1759. It's a patron, you can see her there. Uh, forward-looking, progressive, liberal-minded person who uh, who was trying to uh, get the image of the throne away from this kind of grandiosity that her father-in-law Louis XIV had cultivated around himself, and realizing also that the descendants of Louis XIV were not going to be able to be larger than life, you know, be striders of the earth like he was. He's a very smart person. Now, I want to go over then um, the Odalesque, uh, the courtier, the courtesan, uh, it's a Turkish word originally and comes to mean then prostitute, we would say, but uh, there's a long tradition coming out of Renaissance art. Of course, the Renaissance art um, obsessed in the new science, the new style with the nude, with the body, we're trying to get the body right but still stuck with sort of religiosity. This is an old painting from the Renaissance. This is a 16th century painting by Titian called Venus. Um, you can see um, Titian, an interesting painter we didn't talk about when we went by here. Uh, he's got a certain religiosity. There's a young girl saying her prayers in the background. It's possible to interpret the painting as about uh, wishing for uh, fertility or pregnancy. Um, a couple of other details that you might notice if you go back and look at this. Um, so a very early one, but then establishing this sort of uh, treatment of the reclining nude. And, <clears throat> and so I guess the idea maybe also you can do, maybe it's not just that it's sort of um, a titillating or period or something to have a picture of a courtesan, but perhaps the courtesan then is someone who could then reasonably be represented as lying nude on a sofa. And if what you wanted to do was do nude paintings, then you could, then that's the reason you could do it. Sort of the opposite of doing a religious painting, right? Um, when you have nudes in your religious painting too, when religious paintings are all you're allowed to do. Then later you say, well, I'm not just, it's not just any nude. I mean, it's a courtesan, it's okay. And it's dramatic, you know, something like that. I don't know. Boucher, who we're talking about now, the Blonde Odalisque, 1751. And again, you see um, just a very frank sexuality that I think we overlook sometimes with uh, Rococo art. This is very much considered Rococo art. And Grace, a neoclassicist. Neoclassicist who moved on to Romanticism. We're going to talk about that in couple of minutes here and here he is in 1851 and you see also um, orientalizing we have uh, uh, textiles you've got uh, in the foreground there you've got what looks to be maybe Persian or a Middle Eastern piece of jewelry and you've got some other silks that also look to be Asian and so this oriental um, 
interest. This is another thing that also, by the way, this is a neoclassical painting that also by these earlier 19th century uh, painters also have. We give so much, I love impressionist painting and we're getting to the French impressionists after this in a couple of lessons, but, but um, a lot of the stuff that we credit them for is going on in painting before them. But here's the, the first impressionist painting that we'll see, we won't see impressionists for another week or two in our class, but Manet's Olympia, which caused a big stir in 1863, uh, <clears throat> Notice the black cat at the end. Notice the black servant, not the same as the black cat, bringing um, the flowers from an admirer as well as the, um, I guess the, the choker around her neck and so on. She's got her jewelry on uh, and her shoes. Now, I mean, I'll ask a class, you know, now who do you think, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think about this person? Who do you think this person is? And, uh, you know, one thing about art history is uh, you have to learn to interpret the painting. The thing that was shocking about Manet having the, showing the Olympia at the Salon in 1863 was its frankness. It's frank sexuality. It's frankly a prostitute. It's not. It's, there's. It's not um, shilly shallying. There's no more. What am I trying to say? Tippy toesying, dilly dallying. I don't know. It'll come to me. Uh, okay, so so again, going through that, we have Titian here 200 years before. Then we have the Rococo artist, the guy pushing these boundaries, uh, neoclassical artists following from that, and a French Impressionist artist, this uh, tradition of the female nude. The female nude presented as a courtesan or a prostitute, again, may, maybe because, as I said, that's a context where you could do that. I think a lot of artists are more interested in presenting the form. Fragonard, um, another Rococo painter. And he is, uh, again, we look at these paintings, you can see why these paintings fall into disrepute. Rococo from Pearl, uh, actually the original French word, there was a style of decorating a kind of uh, common style, which was sort of uh, gluing pieces of shells and pearls and things onto surfaces. And then, uh, and that was a sort of folk art or a craft art of rather low repute, which actually came then to be uh, this, this stuff. People said, well, that's Rococo. That's just Rococo. Like you might come up to some poor person's house and they glued a bunch of shells to the wall in a pattern or something like that. Um, I think that's really where Rococo comes from. It's actually an, an art historical term. Anyway, uh, and you can see uh, where it gets that. This looks Japanese to me, I and mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Look at the treatment though of the color, and again, the kind of atmosphere in this place where they always are in Rococo. They're always in a, in a imaginary place, whatever in the real world. One of the ultimate Rococo paintings, the swing, you have her lover on the left, uh, sitting underneath the statue out in the imaginary garden. Notice her shoe is flying off. So we're catching them at a rather uh, peak moment, shall we say, that wonderful moment when her shoe came flying off. To the right, you see the, um, the servant. He's actually got a, a rope that's tied to her so he can pull her. He's not just, I guess he wouldn't want to touch her, right? He's the servant. So you have the servant swing her on her swing while her boyfriend lolls on the ground enjoying the wonderful day in the wonderful park where they are because it's Rococo and this is the Rococo world. It's like uh, the Kardashians, only it's a painting genre. And same uh, painter, Fragonard, the Bolt. I mean, in 1777, a late uh, Rococo painting. And look, it's just frank sexuality. I mean, it's just a sexual painting. And uh, so, as I say, I think that um, there are at least, there is at least some drama to be had in Rococo that I think the popular image of Rococo maybe sort of underestimates uh, some of the Jews. So the basic takeaway take though today, as I say, um, from Rococo to neoclassicism, and um, you know, so, I mean, really the thing about that is the extent to which everything changes. Uh, and 
here's the thing. I mean, uh, we, uh, in talking about the French Revolution, I was, in the other uh, video that I'm giving you alongside this one this week, I talk about the French Revolution quite a bit. Um, the thing is, it's not so much just that you have people like Voltaire with the ideas that he has, or you have um, movements like the neoclassical movement in painting uh, coming up. It's how seriously the French people bought into it. I mean, the, the, the French people were not shy about sort of um, moving away from the monarchy. A lot of them, of course, not everybody by any means. This was a huge civil disruption, a huge civil war, in fact, a real war involving uh, many, many people in France and many different factions. That's for many, many years. Let's say for the 19th century after the revolution, very hard for France. They had a lot of ups and downs and backwards and forwards. So, um, so neoclassical, so now we look at the neoclassical and the neoclassical revival. And of course, in our context, what's happening is that uh, artists are saying, look, and, and they're following Voltaire and the philosophs on this and, this, and Diderot. And these are people, Diderot, remember, of a very influential art critic. So Diderot having a lot to do with turning public opinion away from that sort of ornamental, decadent, more frivolous kind of uh, in the public mind, Rococo style, to the more serious, earnest, really frankly, propagandistic uh, neoclassical style, neoclassical as the title implies. And, uh, and neoclassical interiors, like the neoclassical interiors designed by people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, neoclassical architecture being a huge impact at that time, as well as neoclassical painting. So let's take a look then at um, some of that in our new uh, neoclassical incarnation. So you get uh, what you are familiar with by now. And again, the main takeaway today that, that as these tensions are mounting, moving towards 1789 and the French Revolution, you're seeing a reaction also against uh, these this genre of decorative art. Now, I mean, that also is a little too pat because one thing that's ha that happens when people talk like that is that we're saying that, um, well, there's this sort of linear trajectory of painting styles. And so each new style, uh, maybe if it's reacting, it's reacting against the old style of painting. Neoclassical movement, like the Rococo movement before it, is not just about painting. It's a much more general movement, and it's not just protesting Rococo painting. Of neoclassical uh, art, the neoclassical movement is a movement to get people back into a kind of moralistic, historically aware, politically aware, applied um, kind of practice of public art. As I say, think, think uh, um, even sort of Soviet art sometimes. Um, <clears throat> Voltaire um, leading the charge with this. Voltaire was very good, again, at sorting things out. He figured out you could call uh, the old regime Cartesian. And he also figured out that Rococo was uh, a good way to triangulate on art. I mean, he's a great propagandist. So Voltaire is one of the people who sort of told everybody in the first place that they shouldn't like Rococo. But as I say, there's a lot more to neoclassical you know, than that. What was happening was, you had archaeologists at Pompeii uh, discovering all kinds of things. You had a surge of archaeological progress happening, and you had a sort of mini Renaissance in the sense that the Renaissance is the rebirth of Platonic or classical values. You had another sort of rediscovery of that, which segued very neatly and nicely into this search for relevance and, uh, and, and public engagement that led to neoclassical art. So the two things kind of came together in a very convenient kind of way. Uh, interestingly, this, this art, this neoclassical art, particularly in terms of the sculpture, but in the paintings as well, they didn't understand what they were looking at when they were looking at the classical art very well. They looked at Roman copies of stuff from the Hellenistic period, which is stuff from uh, um, the fall of, of Athens to the, uh, the end of the Alexandrian conquest, but, uh, and, and other kinds of copies and even Renaissance things, um, they'd copy 
they weren't, in other words, the point is just simply that they weren't um, very aware of exactly what was, say, an ancient Greek uh, statue, what was a Roman statue, what was a Hellenistic statue, what was a Renaissance statue even, um, sometimes. Um, interesting point about the neoclassical uh, artists. David, his, he's a charismatic artist. His, his, his canvases really do stick with you. Um, we'll look at three. I think you, you might very well recognize all three of them. The Oath of the Horatii. Now, um, I want to tell, I'm going to step out here and tell a story about this. Uh, one, one semester when I was an undergraduate in college, uh, and I thought I'd try and put together, I don't know what our plan is. I, 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 what, anyway, what happened was one semester in college, somehow or the other, I ended up taking um, 19th century painting. It was an art history class. And I also signed up for introduction to geology for studying rocks. And so these were two of the classes out of, I don't know, four classes or five classes I was taking that semester. And the thing is, in the um, geology class, what the professor used to do for the exams was that he would put different kinds of rocks just around the, around the edges of the room on the tables. And you'd have to go around and identify the rocks and say, what kind of, was it igneous rock or sedimentary rock or, you know, uh, metamorphic rock or whatever it was, and so on. Uh, and what the art history professor would do was that she would show us slides of paintings, of 19th century paintings, and ask us to identify them. How much could we say? Could we say what painting, what, what, uh, who the painter was? We need to be able to say what the genre was, obviously, and so on. So anyway, identification tests. I was getting identification tests in both the geology class and the art history class. So that really kind of struck me and I really uh, uh, kind of thought about that since. And another thing that happened in that class that I wanted to talk about was that this uh, uh, Professor Hassel, her name was Chris Hassel. And what she used to do was ask us to interpret things. And, and I mean, I'm not saying this, I mean, the people in the class, the students in the class, and we were undergraduates, I know it wasn't a very big class. A lot of people had a really hard time interpreting things. And as a teacher, I noticed that my students do have a really hard time interpreting things. I don't think people have a hard time interpreting things because they're dummies. I think people have a hard time interpreting things because they don't have enough practice interpreting things. And one thing that people don't do is they don't give themselves permission to interpret things. Because if you're in some sort of, especially if you're in something like this is high pollutant, right? It's where we're not the three stooges. We're talking about the history of painting. So it's all very, you know, ooh, ooh, ooh. and so nobody wants to make a mistake. But, you know, look, you have to be able to make a mistake. What you have to be able to do is interpret things. So what Professor Hassel used to do, and this, this is the painting that I remember. And, and so ever since then, all these years later, she passed away about a year or so ago, all these years later, I always um, showed my students this painting because this is a painting that she used to show to us, the Oath of Horatia. And then, and she asked us, tell me what's happening in this painting. Tell me the story about what's happening in the painting. Oh, by the way, another thing, I just thought of this. If you're watching this at home and you're not sitting in class, I bet, I bet you can put together a pretty good interpretation of the painting now that you're just by yourself. I bet you can, uh, because well, what's going on? And and so I I remember this when I was from you know 40 years ago looking around at the people in the class. Doesn't anybody else want to interpret the painting? I mean, how hard is it to interpret the painting? The oath of the Rashi is the name. Hint hint. Uh, and you know, look, there's a guy. He's older. He's holding up. How much? What's he holding up? Three swords. Who are these guys on the left? Well, they're uh, soldiers. They have helmets on. They actually have um, ancient Greek hoplite sold, uh, helmets on, but I don't expect you know people to know that. Um, and so what are they doing? They're swearing the oath to him that they're gonna go do what needs to be done. What about these people over on the right? Well, these are the women and the children and how are they feeling? They're feeling bad. Why are they feeling bad? Because the guys are going off to war. They might not come back and kill people. Icky, right? 
And so, right, again, how hard is that? However, in a classroom, I'm just saying, if I put that up and ask a group of people, like 30 people or so, uh, tell me what's going on, they, they can't do it. And why? Because they won't give themselves permission to do it. Um, uh, notice the perspective, notice the treatment, uh, both in terms of vanishing point and uh, chiaroscuro. Now we're coming up into the 19th century and this is, these, um, these neoclassical painters, David in particular, gets a kind of almost a photographic realism. I mean, he studies, uh, these people are, are very well trained. Let's look at another. Death of Socrates, real values. This is classic. What's happening here? This is the scene at the end of Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, where Plato has been sentenced to death uh, by the Athenians. And many people think this is unjust, but Plato, uh, Socrates accepts his fate and Socrates is uh, going to drink the hemlock, the poison, which is in that cup. The executioner has just brought it down. The executioner also, you can see, uh, doesn't want Socrates to drink it. Nobody does, they're all very unhappy. Uh, but Socrates is pointing upwards. Socrates is explaining that his soul is about to be liberated from his body. His soul is going to go join eternal, imperishable, and perfect form. Uh, so, uh, and the nice thing I like about this painting, you have, so you've got over on the left, you've got the man who's a peer of Socrates, the older man there, he's one of his old cronies, right? And notice his posture. He understands what's going on. He understands why Socrates is doing what he's doing. And so he's resigned to it. He's just sitting there. He knows it's going to happen. Meanwhile, the man in the foreground with his hand on Socrates' knee is a middle-aged man, a man maybe in his 40s. He knows enough to know to follow, to listen to the argument. Socrates is really talking to him. You know, Socrates wants to spend the last few minutes uh, of his life doing philosophy and talking about the immortality of the soul. You know, that's what, that's what a real philosopher does. And notice in the background in the middle, you have those two young men, students, and they're straining, right? What are they doing? They're straining to understand. They understand the gravity of the situation. They understand that Socrates is gonna drink the hemlock and die. And they're listening to his words and they're trying, they're trying their hardest to understand what it is that Socrates is saying. So, uh, a lot to see there in um, that painting. And always notice that David is telling these stories and they're revolutionary stories. They're stories about people um, putting, putting themselves out there, the stories about honor. This beautiful, beautiful classic painting, the death of Marat, Marat writing, uh, Marat involved in political intrigue in the reign of <clears throat> terror and David, uh, a friend of Marat's and uh, very close by. I'm not sure if he was even there the day that Marat was assassinated. So, uh, and, a, and an elaborate story, of course, behind all of that, including, as I say, involvements with uh, David. So, uh, but just a, a gorgeous, and so you, see, you call it neoclassical. Neoclassical, not slavishly classical. Um, not even slavishly Renaissance, although, uh, you know, you can see that, that we're coming out of the Renaissance and the Baroque when we look at a painting like this, but, but neoclassical, taking classical sensibility. In Grace, you know, now we're getting up to the point where we start to get um, photographs of people. I don't know why, um, I guess the strategy of getting your suits a couple of sizes too large is, I guess, if you're a big man, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Now, one thing I want to say about um, Ingres here, let's look at this and uh, this sort of treatment, remember the kind of um, treatment of women that you have in the Rococo is a kind of uh, a flip treatment. Oops, sorry. And here we have the Valpincon bather, again, as suffused with a different kind of sense of values and a different kind of attitude altogether all still interested in the nude. And I think, yeah, and this is the other one. I'm sorry, they weren't in the order I wanted them to be in. Uh, and, his, and his painting, The Turkish Bath. You might think of this painting of uh, female nudes as it's the Turkish bath. I mean, you might think of it as meant to be lascivious, but again, the treatment of the figures, the expressions, the postures 
isn't <clears throat> uh, this kind of exploitative treatment of women that we see in, I think, the um, some of the uh, Rococo paintings. Here we see a more a greater seriousness of purpose. Of course, um, this being Ingres, we have some really crazy um, uh, French Revolution propaganda. Here's uh, Homer sort of congratulating the French Revolution on its final triumph of civiliz civilization. That the French Revolution is the ultimate triumph of civilization. And there's quite a lot of these kind of daffy paintings uh, with various famous figures uh, from history and from the time uh, arranged in the painting. Of course, if you like that sort of thing, you can try and figure out who they are and then go look at all the, all, all the keys and things. Again, uh, Joan of Arc, the coordination of Charles VII, uh, a historical painting, not a painting of something happening at the time, a painting of something that happened centuries before a great moment in the battle of French nationalism. And so um, again, a kind of a much more heroic kind of treatment of women that we see in Ingres than notably than different from Rococo. Uh, now there's is, I'm just gonna show you a, I think two more paintings. There is something else because after this, we're gonna do some other stuff. Then we come back to painting in a couple of topics. We're gonna to talk about French Impressionism. So we're gonna move on from this um, coming into the 19th century here. But I really wanted to show you a couple of painters, two painters, in fact, who are uh, real interesting. We call them romantic painters rather than neoclassical painters. What's the difference? In the uh, early 19th century, the early 1800s, Romanticism is another movement um, coming out of the Industrial Revolution uh, and urbanization and again, increased population. The Romantics are not as um, earnest as the neoclassicists. The Romantics are concerned about the individual in the face of uh, urbanization, in the face of mass society. This kind of notion of the um, alienated artist. You'd classically, you know, the artist was someone who was sort of helping to edify society and spread kind of civilized values. Our um, stereotype of the artist that's sort of dressed in black and smoking cigarettes and kind of alienated rebel is a romantic notion of the artist that's distinctly modern. Uh, so again, an, an emphasis of uh, getting back to emotions, a worry that all of the science of the new age was kind of swallowing up our natural emotional experience, both of nature and, our, and of ourselves. Uh, and again, orientalizing and orientalizing in, in a sense of searching for uh, other outlets of expression rather than canonical European ones, which as I mentioned before, is something that anticipates uh, French expressionism, uh, uh, French impressionism and post-impressionism. So uh, two, just quickly, and I'm, I think I'm just gonna show you one painting of each one, uh, Jerry Coe and the Raft of the Medusa, an intense drama, uh, apparently based on a real story. You see the ship off in the distance, a little speck uh, that they're frantically waving towards and you see the treatment of the bodies and uh, very dramatic, somewhat manneristic, but he will always, you can always count on him for this very dramatic stuff. And Delacroix looking very, very dashing there. And Liberty leading the people. Um, not neoclassic, but romantic and, uh, and emotional. And another example of a kind of orientalizing style. And this one, you know, you can sort of see Rococo, but this looks to me like a Mannerist painting. And so maybe another thing we're seeing here, because after all, we're in 1860 here, is a kind of run up to uh, French Impressionism. So um, yeah, you'll see when we do the French Impressionists next, the painting really, really changes. But so just to sum up today, very, very quickly, what did we see? We saw a century that started with Louis XIV, the Sun King, and coming into Rococo ornamental art and a kind of uh, haute bourgeois kind of decadent phase of history, but the clock is ticking. And by the end of that century, 
an incredible historical cataclysm in the French Revolution, upending the European order altogether and anticipating that, contributing to that, helping to cause that, we have neoclassicism, which definitely sees itself as sort of the anti-Rococo, getting back to realism, getting back to values, getting back to historical and political relevance. And so that's uh, um, good for us because it's easy to see the connection between the painting and the, and the political history. And that's, as I said at the very beginning, what uh, humanities is all about. All right, I'll see you next week.